curious thing happened at this year's G20 meeting. New Delhi has transformed. Now, the G20 is not a place where curious things usually happen. It's a very serious annual meeting where a heap of countries talk about stuff like economics, climate change, that kind of thing. The message is simple. By hosting the world's top leaders, India has arrived as a top power. But when the host country, India, sent out their very fancy formal invitations, everyone got a bit of a surprise. It said the president of Bharat requests the pleasure of your company. Not India, Bharat. And when Prime Minister Narendra Modi sidled up to his round table discussion, his nameplate said Bharat as well. This summit has been a carefully staged managed event. Now, India has always gone by both names internally. Lots of countries have internal names. Zhongguo, Nippon, Dehan Minguk, Deutschland and Aotearoa are all the internal names of the countries we call China, Japan, Korea, Germany and New Zealand. And now there's speculation that the parliament is going to change the constitution, drop the name India completely, and make the name of the country Bharat for good. If so, you're going to need a new atlas. Funnily enough, the debate over this isn't new. It goes all the way back to when the country gained independence in 1947. The new nation, divided by religion and a deep social hierarchy, needed to be united under one name. And there was one man who was asked to do it. B. R. Ambedkar is the father of India's constitution and the man who made the choice to give the country two names, India and Bharat. His life story is actually extraordinary. And the reasons why he gave the country two names tell a really important story about India's history. So why, nearly 80 years on, might his work be undone. I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. In 1947, India gained independence from the British. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic. But it took several years to write the constitution. Every line of it was very carefully written. Every word and punctuation mark was fiercely fought over. In our constituent assembly, do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this constitution. One of the most contentious parts is the very first article of the constitution, which reads, India, comma, that is Bharat, comma, shall be a union of states. And the man who wrote those words is Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, the chief architect of the Indian constitution. For Indians, he's one of their most complicated and debated historical figures. Dr. Ambedkar dedicated his life to the cause of the downtrodden in their struggle for equality and justice. But the reason he chose these names for the country all comes back to his childhood and the future he was fighting for. The town Ambedkar was born in is now named after him, which is surprising considering the conditions he was born into there. Ambedkar's family were untouchables. Do you know what it means to be an untouchable? It is like being condemned to the land of the dead. India's historical caste system divides followers of Hinduism into rigid social groups or castes, the Brahmins, an educated caste of priests and teachers, are at the top of the hierarchy. Then there's a caste of warriors and rulers, a caste of merchants and farmers, and a caste of manual labourers. And outside of the four castes, there's the untouchables. In Hindi, Harajans, consigned to live in poverty, uneducated, doing the dirtiest work. Basically dealing with all different kinds of human and animal waste. They also work with leather, something banned by the Hindu religion. It is not the menial work or the poverty. It is the scorn of the high born that burns our souls. They are considered by some who still follow these rigid rules to be impure, both spiritually and literally. And it was believed that touching them would spread that impurity. The upper caste feel that the lower castes are 
meant to do this work and will do this work for, for the rest of their lives. The British, however, were happy to employ the untouchables and employed Ambedkar's father as an officer in the British Army. It meant that Ambedkar and his 13 siblings could get an education. But at school, he and the other untouchables were segregated. He was only allowed to sit on a Hessian sack, which he brought with him from home. His teachers did not touch his schoolwork to mark it. He was expressly forbidden from studying Sanskrit, the ancient language most Hindu religious texts are written in. Everywhere he was subjected to the sting of caste discrimination, but he persevered in his quest for learning. If he was thirsty, the school's lowest ranked worker would turn on a tap and pour water into his hands to drink. He was not allowed to touch the tap or a well or a cup. Even a dog can go near the well but not the Harijans. They must keep their distance and wait for mercy. He was brilliant, a genius, according to many. Despite his caste, he was accepted into a fancy Mumbai school, graduated university, and was given a scholarship to study at Columbia University in New York. From there, he studied at the London School of Economics. He became the first untouchable to gain a PhD. He actually got two and the first to become a barrister. He was a polymath, able to speak with authority about economics, law, political science, sociology, history, religion, and philosophy. And when he returned to India, he was treated as a member of the elite. He was invited to big events as a representative of the untouchables. Dr. Ambedkar now emerged as the undisputed leader of the depressed classes. Embedkar's aim was to destroy the caste system, annihilate it. We want untouchability to be abolished. But we also want that we must be given equal opportunities so that we may rise to the level of the other classes. Embedkar became the most highly respected legal mind in India. And when Indian independence was achieved, he was made Minister of Law and Justice and put in charge of writing the constitution. He wanted to write one which abolished castes and brought equality to Indian women. But from the outset, he knew this was going to be unbelievably difficult. On the 15th of August 1947, British rule of the Indian subcontinent ended after 300 years. British India covered not just modern-day India, but Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. But unbelievably, on Independence Day, the new Indian government didn't really know where its borders were. The reason is that the British lawyer, Sir Cyril Radcliffe, hadn't told them yet. Sir Cyril had been tasked with dividing up British India to try and separate the two main religious groups, Hindus and Muslims. For Hindus, India. For Muslims, Pakistan. Carved out of the subcontinent of India, Pakistan ranks fifth in population among the countries of the world. So Cyril had been sent to the subcontinent specifically because he'd never been there before, and therefore he would be impartial. He absolutely hated it. After five weeks there, he wrote, The heat is so appalling that at noon it looks like the blackest night and feels like the mouth of hell. After a few days of it, I seriously began to wonder whether I would come out of it alive. On Independence Day, Sir Cyril, the sweatiest man in India, fled to England, leaving behind the maps he'd drawn. The new Pakistani and Indian governments were handed the maps after they had finished celebrating independence. But the country Sir Cyril created was geographically bizarre, with half of Pakistan on one side of India and half on the other. Its land area is split into two non-contiguous geographical units in the eastern and western sections of what had been Britain's Indian Empire. We now know the two sections as Pakistan and Bangladesh. The border sliced through the middle of the historical regions of Punjab and Bengal, leaving millions separated from their friends and family. Many are still separated to this day. Millions of people decided that Sir Cyril had put them in the wrong country and fled across the border in both directions as refugees. 
It was the largest mass migration in human history. Wars were fought over this. Records weren't kept, but estimates indicate that millions of people died, including Mahatma Gandhi, who was shot dead by a guy who didn't like how it was all handled. The light has gone out of our lives. Our beloved leader, the father of the nation, is no more. On top of that, deals done by the British meant that the new country of India only controlled 60% of its territory. The rest was ruled by more than 500 princes who had to be uh, convinced to give up their land and join the new union. This was the country Ambedkar was being asked to write a uniting document for, a country in abject chaos. After three years of negotiation, the constitution was finally almost complete. But one serious issue remained. What should this new country, which had no shared history except for British oppression, be called? Let us leave aside slogans. Let us leave aside words which frighten people. Let us even make concession to the prejudices of our opponents. Bring them in so that they may willingly join with us on marching upon that road. The people in the vast territory now controlled by India had never walked together on any road before. But Ambedkar said, If we walk long enough, that road must necessarily lead us to unity. And he didn't want that unity to come through the tyranny of the majority. Just because Hindus were the biggest religious and linguistic group didn't mean that they could do whatever they wanted. Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, Sikhs and untouchables needed to be represented too. In some states, they were the majority religion. Many people associated the name India with British occupation. But finding a better one everyone could agree on was really difficult. History wasn't much help. Before the British, They'd been ruled by the Islamic Mughal Emperor, and they didn't want that either. The Orthodox Hindus wanted to call it Bharat, a term for a mythical civilization which an ancient Hindu religious text says once existed where India now lies. The word was already in wide use. Gandhi used it in his prayers. But Bharat is a word from Sanskrit, a language that the untouchables had been forbidden from learning. This was kind of the tyranny of the majority. Hindus naming a new, secular, multicultural country after their own religious law. In a play for unity, Ambedkar wrote, India, that is Bharat, is a union of states. And in a special session in India's parliament house, it was adopted. All these decades later, Ambedkar's constitution is considered a symbol of equality internationally. By including both names, the constitution tries to represent everyone, not just Hindus. And not just the upper class Hindus, but the untouchables as well. Untouchability stands abolished, and any imposition of disability on this account is an offence. This week marked 74 years to the day after that decision, and two major things are happening that will open a new chapter in India's history. Firstly, Parliamentarians crossed the road from their old circular parliament house, considered too old and outdated, to an ultra-modern triangular one, surrounded by statues of Hindu gods and leaders, including Dr. Ambedkar. And as they crossed the road, speculation was also rife that Prime Minister Narendra Modi was planning to celebrate that change by removing India from the country's constitution. The big question is, why? For most of the years since independence, India has been ruled by the Congress Party, previously led by Mahatma Gandhi himself. But for the last nine years, Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party has been in power. And in that time, violence against untouchables, now referred to as Dalits, as well as Muslims and Buddhists, has increased. Anyone challenging the authority of the top castes is under threat. In 2016, a 21-year-old Dalit nursing student was lynched after his phone rang, revealing that his ringtone was a song celebrating Ambedkar. 
This year, another Dalit was lynched for organising a celebration of Ambedkar's birthday. The opposition says this violence is because Modi empowers upper caste extremists and Hindu vigilante gangs and passes discriminatory laws. Modi's party, the BJP, denies the charge and say that they embrace the legacy of Ambedkar. Meanwhile, the party's defenders in the media claim the real issue is discrimination against Hindus. Ladies and gentlemen, it is inconceivable. The level of hatred against Hinduism is inconceivable that the DMK and the Congress should be calling for the eradication of Hinduism. The DMK and Congress parties are not trying to eradicate Hinduism, but they are trying to eradicate Modiism. They're among 28 opposition parties calling themselves the Indian National Development Inclusive Alliance, or INDIA, India for short. What a coincidence. We consider ourselves to be the voice of India, and so the, the, the word works very well. Opposition leader Rahul Gandhi, no relation, says this has sent the BJP into a panic. It's obviously disturbed the Prime Minister enough that he wants to change the name of the country. And so as the politicians cross the road into the new parliament, the question on everyone's lips is, will Modi change Dr. Ambedkar's words to Bharat is a union of states? We'll have to see if that helps or hinders their walk on Ambedkar's road to unity.